welcome all of you to this forum on peace and war, or war and peace in Ukraine. I'm Stuart Reese. I'm your chairperson for the next couple of hours. At the moment, I'm sitting on Geringer country on the south coast of New South Wales. Wherever you are, whatever indigenous land you're on, I want on your behalf to acknowledge the stewardship of that land by elders past, present and sharing with us that responsibility into the future. And that's that recognition and acknowledgement also applies to friends of ours who are tuning into this forum from, from overseas. These are demanding and dangerous times and the huge interest in this forum uh, reflects that. I'm going to, um, after uh, I've described the four speakers and, and after they've spoken, uh, we will move to the wonderful Jemima Omari giving her in interpretation of John Lennon's Imagine. At that point in the last chords of her song, we'll move quickly into the forum when you can uh, ask questions of any single member of the panel or, or um, all of them. And you do that by recording your questions in the, in the chat column. So at this point, I'm going to return to uh, my former colleague, because we're both, uh, we both left Sydney University now, my former colleague, uh, Emeritus Professor Graham Gill from the Department of Government and uh, International Relations at Sydney University. Graham's a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences of Australia. He's the president of the Council for the Study of, um, uh, of European and far, far, um, far Eastern Studies. But most of important of all, and it displays the reason why he's been invited to start proceedings this evening, he's an expert on Russia, and in particular on post-Soviet politics. That uh, is the essential element of um, uh, Graham's reputation as I see it and why we are pleased indeed to have him start the proceedings. The microphone is yours, Graham. Thank you very much, Stuart. I, uh, I might uh, start by saying I feel honored to be present uh, at, this, uh, at this meeting and to be opening it in talking about uh, triggers for war, why and how did the Ukraine war occur? Now, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022 burst onto the <laughs> scene and has, within a few short months, upturned much of what international politics was thought to be about, at least thought to be about in the developed West. Despite the elevated rhetoric, and if we think about it, the, uh, the Ukrainian war is neither the first armed conflict in Europe since the end of the Cold War, think of the Yugoslav Wars of the 1990s, nor is it the first time a nuclear armed country or countries has invaded a non-nuclear country. Think of Libya, Syria and Afghanistan. And it does not appear that uh, many of those countries that are in what was used to be called the third world consider this event to be as important as it is considered by uh, the industrialized West. Nevertheless, despite this elevated rhetoric, this is a serious challenge to the world going forward. So how did it come about? The usual explanation is that it's all attributed to Russian President Vladimir Putin. This explanation is usually accompanied by the claim that there is no one in Putin's circle who would dare to contradict him. And therefore this decision to invade was made by him alone. Now, if this is the case, it's a very different form of decision-making from the decision-making style that Putin has followed over the previous 20 years. While he's been president, he has always followed a consultative path. Certainly it's consultative within a limited range, but he's always sought the views of those he trusted and some of those who had relevant expertise. Given the long lead up time to preparation for the invasion, mm. and after all, there were reports of the Russian troop build up uh, in the middle of 2021. So we're talking about um, 
you know, nine, 10 months before the invasion actually started. So given this long lead time, are we really to believe that the reasons for this were not discussed at top levels in Russia? Do we really think that the Russia military... Did not discuss at top levels is... Do we really think that the military top brass and the civilians at the top of the system weren't talking about what they were going to do with these troops? Clearly, it's a collective decision. But within that context, Putin was obviously the major player, and his words do give us some guidance as to the thinking behind the invasion. In seeking to understand the war and Putin's outlook, it's useful, I think, to recognize a major lesson from the 20th century. The roots of one war are often to be found in the terms of the settlement of the previous war. No one seeks to explain the Second World War without reference to the Versailles Peace ending the First World War. And the Cold War was a direct product of the way in which the Second World War was wound up. Similarly, the end of Cold War settlement fed directly into the current conflict. Two aspects of that settlement are most relevant. First, the breakup of the Soviet Union, resulting in the independence of the former Union Republics, of which Ukraine was clearly the second most important after Russia. In other words, a single political union was broken up into a, a number of different independent um, countries. Second, the decision not to introduce a new pan-European security architecture, but instead to expand the Cold War institutions, principally NATO, while rebuffing any idea that Russia could become a full member of this. I think both of these are crucial to Putin's thinking leading into the Ukraine war. But of course, it's been the first one which has been most present in Western attempts to frame that conflict. Much has been made of Putin's argument that Ukraine does not constitute a bona fide state, nor did Ukrainians have their own sense of national identity. This has been a view that Putin has articulated going back to at least 2008. It's not new, but it's been given much more prominence in the eight months before the invasion with, Ukraine, with Putin arguing that Ukraine was a false entity created by the USSR. He's argued that Ukraine does not represent a true state. It's something false that was set up uh, um, as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union and that it was an entity that was created by the Soviet Union. He argued that the Ukrainians, along with the Belarusians, were essentially Russian. They were all one people living on a common land with a common culture, language, and values. Now, the development of these ideas was propelled by the increasing influence that seems to have been exercised over Putin uh, by right-wing nationalist forces in Russia over the last two decades, where these have moved from being essentially very marginal groups to marginal groups that are nevertheless to be found in the mainstream because of the influence that some of their, uh, their spokespeople have been able to exercise over Putin. Uh, and it's been reinforced by the Orthodox Church. This development, <clears throat> of failing to see Ukrainians as a separate people is reflected in the increasing importance Putin has placed on the notion of Russia as having its own unique path of development, separate from the West and separate from Asia. And this has been accompanied by his determination to revive a great Russia, which can achieve this destiny. Now, this view with regards to the Russia-Ukraine relationship is quite tendentious. He is correct only in the sense that the boundaries of an independent Ukraine were established in the Soviet period, 
and many of the institutions and the political culture that were present in Ukraine were emanations from the Soviet Union. So the, the actual outline of the state as it existed prior to the, uh, the invasion was a function of the period in the Soviet Union. They were Soviet drawn borders. Historically, Ukraine was not a formal constituent element of the Russian empire. In other words, in the pre-Soviet pre Russian empire, there was no formal unit, administrative unit called Ukraine. Provinces that currently comprise Ukraine were part of the empire, but there was no section of it called Ukraine, just as there was no section of it called Russia, because it was all considered to be Russia. But there had been a notionally independent Ukrainian state before its incorporation into the Russian Empire. So it's wrong to say that there was never a Ukrainian state prior to the Soviet period. Also, Ukrainians clearly had a sense of national identity, forcefully expressed at the time of the Soviet collapse in their support for an independent Ukraine rather than an association in some larger grouping. But ultimately, whether Putin was right or wrong historically was irrelevant to his beliefs. His belief that Ukrainians and Russians and Belarusians were one was what counted. And it was this view that was crucial to his understanding of what was occurring in Ukraine over the past 20 years, since the color revolution of 2004. If Ukrainians were the same as Russians, sharing the same values and beliefs, how could Ukraine pursue a path that was at variance with Russian interests? The answer had to be that control of the state had been seized by a group of people that was intent on ripping Ukraine away from Russia against the wishes of its own people. This is the view that Putin put. But who were these people and who had seized control of Ukraine? Who were the so-called fascists referred to in the official explanations of the special military operation undertaken by the Russian army? And this is where the second aspect of the post-Cold War settlement comes in. NATO was always seen as a hostile anti-Russian alliance. How could it be seen as anything else when it has seemed inexorably to advance eastward to the very edge of Russia while at the same time maintaining that Russia itself could not become a member. Russia is the only European state that was told it could never become a member. Feeding into the conviction widespread in leading circles in Moscow that the West had sought to exploit Russia's weakness in the 1990s, the incorporation into NATO of the former Soviet republics of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania and former allies in Eastern Europe confirmed the conviction of those around Putin that NATO was intent on weakening and opposing Russia. Ukrainian flirting with joining the EU and NATO around the time of the Maidan revolution of 2014 and subsequent to that seemed to add substance to the fear that Western leaders sought to attract this part of Russia away from the homeland. Can I interject, inter, 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 uh, can I say here too, that, that if we look at the, the, the Russian elite around Putin, they would be virtually united in this view of NATO. They would not be united in the view of the relationship between Ukraine and Russia that Putin has put forward and that I outlined before. Now, some have sought to argue that NATO had nothing to do with creating the conditions that led to the invasion, saying it was only Putin's view of Ukraine that was relevant. The problem with this view is Belarus. Conceived as part of the single Russian culture block, just like Ukraine was, Belarus has not been subject to the same treatment as Ukraine. This is because Belarus is firmly aligned with, Ra with uh, Russia, formerly part of a so-called uh, union state, which never actually amounts to very much, but formally it's there. It's the relationship with NATO that is the difference between Ukraine and Belarus in Russian eyes. 
and therefore it's the it's the role of NATO and the perceived uh, role NATO is playing that's crucial to the invasion. <clears throat> but if ultimately it was the NATO factor that underpins the invasion, why now? After all, it's been evident for a number of years that uh, uh, that uh, NATO has been expanding and it's been evident for a number of years that there are, have been strong forces within Ukraine seeking to join. Extreme right wing, right -wing groups, <clears throat> but so why now? Extreme right-wing groups have been active in Ukraine for some time, and uh, but they've never been close to power. And while there have been policies that have been seen to be prejudicial to predominantly Russian-speaking parts of the country, and there have been exchanges of fire across the Donbass ceasefire line, there is no credible evidence of genocide against Russian speakers in Ukraine. So that there's nothing happened in that regard recently, which would trigger the invasion. Rather, I think the assault seems to have been opportunistic, designed to take advantage of perceived American weakness. Obama's drawing of the red line uh, about the use of chemical weapons in Syria, and then his refusal to follow up when those weapons were, uh, were used the whole four years of the Trump presidency, the uh, confrontation with China, and ultimately, ultimately the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan were all interpreted in Moscow, I think, as evidence of declining American power and potentially declining American will. <laughs> in addition, Putin underestimated the capacity of the West to mount a united and decisive response he also underestimated the capacity of the Ukrainians to resist, and he exaggerated the capacity of the Russian army to win a quick victory. Finding a peaceful end to this will be difficult, but central is the role of NATO and the West. While they continue with a policy designed in the words of various Western leaders to weaken Russia, to fight uh, to let Ukrainians fight to the last person, the conflict is unlikely to end. Such a policy will only continue the fighting and the devastation. Only discussions between Russia and Ukraine can end the conflict, because it's only those two parties that have any hope of resolving the on-ground situation. But given the relationship between Ukraine and the West, and in particular, the Americans, that resolution will need to be ticked off in Washington and Brussels. Resolving the on-ground uh, resolving the on-ground issues will be a difficult enough task. It should not be made any more difficult by Western attempts either to punish Russia or to weaken her. Thank you, Graham. Thank you for that rich, uh, insightful, characteristically scholarly analysis. Thank you very much. Uh, and at that point, I move to my colleague, Dr. Jake Lynch, and, and, in, and I'll introduce Jake. Jake um, is from the Department of Peace Studies at the University of Sydney. Before that, he had a very distinguished career as a journalist with the London Independent, with Sky News and with the BBC. Jake's uh, justifiable worldwide reputation is for his analysis of the ways in which the media uh, affects what we think we know and how we might think about what we know. And in that respect, we've asked Jake this evening to look at the Australian media's coverage of the Ukraine war. Over to you, Jake. Well, thanks, Stuart, and um, good evening, everyone. Yes, I'm going to um, uh, try to share my screen and um, a few PowerPoints. Um, and um, I should begin by saying that I, I, I'm really not in a position, uh, and I haven't attempted, um, to um, conduct any um, serious um, and quantitative analysis of media coverage in Australia of the Ukraine war. We, we're in a situation of media plenitude um, for good or ill. And of course, um, there's been a very great deal of coverage from a great many um, outlets. But what I'm gonna do is perhaps pick out some, um, I think important themes to enable us to think um, about this issue. And um, I'm going to be cheeky um, uh, and begin with a, a possibly apocryphal quote uh, 
um, from when the great American writer Mark Twain was asked to define the difference between uninformed and misinformed. And his answer was, if you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. If you do read the newspaper, you're misinformed. Uh, and that might, be a, that might be a cruel exaggeration, but I think it has some continuing resonance in this context. And in general, and I stress these are generalizations, what I've found as a, a listener, reader and viewer is that um, Australian mainstream media at least tend to present the war in Ukraine as a narrative confined almost entirely to surface presenting phenomena, a series of events, often violence events, of course, they concentrate on the overt words and deeds of identifiable conflict actors, known to journalists as sources. Of course, that's what journalists are supposed to do. But unfortunately, that um, leaves journalism stuck in what Stephen Lukes, the political scientist Stephen Lukes, calls the behavioral dimension of power. And focusing only on that dimension can obscure or eclipse the other dimensions, the second and third dimensions, which are the hidden agendas of these same actors and most importantly, the effects of system and structure. Now, some of the effects that Graham was referring to, the expansion of NATO, the kind of gravitational pull in the geostrategic European space left over after the Cold War, the political agency that has driven that uh, sequence can be chalked up to systems and structures which can be mobilized in all sorts of hidden ways. And we risk overlooking them um, if we concentrate only on these surface presenting phenomena. Uh, in my view, um, overall, and this is again a, a great generalization, we are seeing a dominant strain of what I would regard as war journalism. And war journalism means not merely the reporting of war, but the reporting of conflict in such a way as to leave us cognitively primed for further violence. And I'm going to suggest that there is a need to support, strengthen and spread the influence of independent alternative media as essential kit for critical thinking. So I'll say a few things about news as a context of influence in conflict, and we can divide that into two categories, the influences of the news and the influences on the news. And many people have tried to model influences on news content. One of the most famous models is the propaganda model by Herman and Chomsky, in which they propose five filters on news content. Two of them are owner interests and the interests of sources. So it's what sources want to talk about um, is reflected in what journalists then cover if they know what's good for them, because that keeps them in with the sources, for example. Um, others include um, the indexing model put forward by W. Lance Bennett, where there is disagreement in news over issues of controversy, but that is often limited to the extent of contestation between branches of the elite. In a political regime such as Australia's, uh, the difference of view between the front benches of Labour and the coalition, for example. And on this question, of course, uh, it's very difficult to insert even so much as a, a cigarette paper between them. Uh, and that is one of the, um, the problems, I think. So that brings me to the influences of the news. What are the media effects? And they are generally divided into two categories, agenda setting, which means what to think about, and framing, or how to think about it. And the um, scholar Robert Entman, again, Apologies, this is all uh, North American scholarship we're talking about, but it's a very useful way to, um, to conceive of framing, um, which is to um, make salient in a communicating text aspects which go to the moral evaluation, problem definition, causal explanation, and treatment recommendation. That is, what we think will happen next, what we think should happen next, depends on how the problem is diagnosed and how the causes are attributed. Uh, and they operate in feedback loops in both audience responses and commensurately source behaviors. Um, so these are how the, the influences of, of media can spread. And as a generalization, and I think it applies here, um, if there is a pattern whereby um, we are not consistently reminded of the reasons for the behavior of a particular conflict actor, some of the points Graham was making, we can all too easily be led or left to infer that they must be unreasonable. If they're unreasonable, there's no point reasoning with them, or to put it another way, negotiating with them. So the only remaining option is the use of force. Hence in The Guardian, The Guardian's prospered in its Australia edition in the past few years. Uh, one of its um, most prominent writers is Simon Tisdall, the paper's former international editor. Uh, and this is the headline from one of, by my count, at least five 
separate pieces that he has contributed, all of which make the argument for all-out war between NATO and Russia. Now, it obviously doesn't bother um, the Guardian editors that much. They, they keep on commissioning these pieces. Neither do they ever seem to challenge him to, to explain how that would avoid escalation into a, a full-on nuclear holocaust. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it seems to fit with the pattern of reporting. You know, Sam Tistle's a highly skilled, highly experienced newspaper opinion writer. And that's because he is to be found basing his arguments on the reporting of these surface pre presenting phenomena and on the overt words and deeds of, of conflict actors. So the, the nature of the opinion writing is a good fit with the nature of the journalism. Uh, and that's what we get as a result. Now, um, this is um, how the pattern um, eventuates, the dominant pattern of, of war journalism. And I'm just going to digress briefly into this um, model, Johann Galtung's peace journalism model, which has been the organizing principle for um, reform efforts, um, media development aid, and indeed um, analytical uh, scholarship. And um, what we're seeing is, is a dominant pattern whereby we're presented with just two parties contesting the single goal of victory. And crucially, the causes of the conflict and therefore the exits from the conflict are confined to the arena. That is the, the geographical space where the armed hostilities are occurring. And that obscures or even eclipses the process that led up to the events, the hidden dimensions, the further layers beneath the presenting reality, uh, and that is um, uh, what is responsible for this persistent finding about media effects, whereby um, audiences exposed to war journalism will assume that further violence is the logical, inevitable, even desirable corollary to the events as presented. Whereas data from field experiment shows that audiences exposed to peace journalism are more likely to consider and value non-violent responses. So some of the issues that Graham was mentioning, if we were regularly reminded of them in the framing um, of the journalism that we consume, uh, would make us more receptive to those kinds of initiatives. Now, let me move on to um, speak a little bit about the ABC, a sister organization to the BBC, of course, where I spent most of my journalistic career. And um, you've seen these, these nature documentaries, um, David Attenborough nature documentaries on the BBC, when they, uh, they, they capture in frame uh, a deer or an antelope uh, that's been suddenly alarmed in the forest and its nostrils flaring and ears twitching. Well, that is the perennial condition of the BBC itself. Uh, it's, it's always on the alert. And of course, what's, what's lurking in the undergrowth is not so much a crouching tiger as the hidden dragon of the Tories um, and, uh, you know, waiting in the, in the wings to get them. Um, and um, uh, it, there's a very sort of um, recognisable default condition of public service media, public media in particular, um, of being um, uh, very nervous about actually fulfilling their remit. You see, the ABC, like the BBC's public service media, it should be de delivering these two public goods of accuracy and impartiality. Um, but as with the BBC, it would much rather put controversial issues in the impartiality basket, where they are a matter of a, a contest of two different views. So. I draw attention to this interview uh, by Hamish MacDonald on Radio National Breakfast a few weeks ago um, as uh, something to note for its rarity value, um, which is that he was actually um, jousting with the Russian ambassador Alexei Pavlovsky uh, and um, insisting on accurate reporting. So he was saying, no, no, you're wrong, ambassador. This is not, this shouldn't be referred to as a military operation. It is a war and it is an invasion, for example, okay? And he said, at one point, you're welcome to express your view, but if you make things up, you'll be challenged. Um, and the Russian ambassador made some interesting points, including, as he said there, um, seeming to, to suggest that Ukraine itself um, would be keener um, on signing an agreement not to join NATO, for example, not to host military bases, than some of its Western military backers. And he, he quoted um, Boris Johnson, uh, formerly, um, or still the Prime Minister of, uh, of the UK, of course. Uh, but it, it's the interesting thing about this it, is that this indicates from an ABC point of view and a public service media point of view, an awareness that they have complete political cover. You know, they are not likely to get into trouble for factual reporting and to be ticked off um, in, for, for, for doing that instead of pretending that there are two equal and opposite sides to every question. 
Uh, it, it's an awareness that there is no danger um, of any political comeback on them. And that testifies to the extent of political consensus in Australia on this particular view of the conflict, I think. And I think it's a, an interesting fact. So much then for uh, mainstream media, let's turn to alternative media or independent media. One of them being the redoubtable Green Left Weekly. And Green Left Weekly is um, 20 years old this year. And um, I've been impressed by the reporting of its Europe correspondent, Dick Nichols, uh, not because of its political slant at all, but because of its, the fact that it has exemplified um, old fashioned, robust journalistic virtues of diverse sourcing, for example. So uh, he is one of the few uh, reporters, I think, um, whom I've seen, who's um, given serious attention to some of the dissension within the Russian political structure. So the picture illustrating his article there, the upper one, um, is um, a group of people who are demonstrating against the preponderance of ethnic minorities among the troops being sent to risk their lives in the invasion of Ukraine. And uh, by the same token, some of their political representatives are demanding the immediate withdrawal of Russian forces. So that's quite granular stuff in terms of engaging constructively um, with the politics of this situation uh, within Russia, certainly compared with, um, with most of the, the reporting we've seen. And then um, a later piece, the lower picture there, um, was about the NATO summit in Madrid. And he um, delved into the dissension within the Spanish parliament and among Spanish political parties about the meaning of this event. And he quoted the Podemos MP uh, Gerardo Pizarreo, um, who attacked the warmongering zeal and said this summit was basically organized to reinforce the strategic priorities of the United States, which are not Ukraine, not Europe, but above all weakening China. Um, in, later in the same piece, he covered the, uh, the vote by uh, Sweden to, um, to join NATO and quoted a, a, a left party um, regressing the, the decision to do so. So um, at the very least, that is beginning to disaggregate the parties to this conflict. It's beginning to remind us that there are other layers on which influence is being exerted, other priorities that are being um, pursued by some of the protagonists. And that's a helpful, helpful um, a breach in the wall, you might think, compared with the kind of smooth um, surface and um, uh, uh, superficial treatment of, of a lot of the, um, the reporting we see elsewhere. And I can't um, go without giving a plug to pearls and irritations. Um, and I think the plan is for um, we as uh, speakers to contribute a piece each to a pearls and irritations, summarizing our arguments. Um, and if um, Dick Nichols uh, brought us a diversity of sources, this brings us a diversity of perspectives. Um, and a juxtaposition for critical thinking. And it was the only Australian media, I believe, to report the statement recently from the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, calling, on, uh, calling for, for greater attention to the um, uh, potential of peace initiatives. And in particular, a peace plan by the Italian government has four points, a ceasefire, Ukraine's neutrality, ongoing negotiations over Crimea and Donbass, and multilateral negotiations with the OSCE. So um, we need to have more um, on that kind of of that kind of um, media in Australia. Here's a few um, logos here from um, uh, independent media from elsewhere. The UK's Open Democracy, ProPublica from the United States, Platform Authentica Journalistiken from the Netherlands, uh, the Narwhal from Canada. Um, these are um, not merely um, uh, uh, sites for the exchange of a range of, of views, a range of perspectives, as with pearls and irritations, vital as that is, they are actually contributing to the news agenda by doing their own original and highly impressive investigative reporting. That's a, a big undertaking, of course, um, requires a lot of commitment, requires a lot of resource, and it gives rise to demands for or ideas for um, uh, policy reforms here in Australia to make that kind of media more possible. Uh, so in uh, 2011, the Finkelstein Inquiry on Media Diversity received submissions calling for independent news, such as a journalism funding council, never implemented, but it's still there. And ProPublica is one of these um, news organizations in the United States that benefits from uh, non-profit tax exempt status, the 501c3 status, 
which we really could do with emulating here. So overall, the picture is that in the liminal spaces, it is possible for us to track down and find out what's going on in these other layers to acquaint ourselves with the hidden causes and therefore the opportunities for exits from this conflict, which might otherwise be obscured, but it takes a lot of doing. It is not being routinely drawn to our attention. And for that to happen, we need more and more influential in independent youth organizations, such as the ones there. The sector is relatively underdeveloped here in Australia, and we need to think about how to develop it. Jake, thank you uh, very much for that incredibly rich account. I mean, you've drawn beautifully that distinction between agenda setting and framing, um, what we're supposed to know and how we're allowed to, to think about it. And we'll come back to that. And thank you too for that um, appeal about the significance of independent media. And I'll come to our wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Sue Wareham. Now, Sue is always modestly described as a former Canberra GP. But beneath that description lie uh, a numerous significant events. Perhaps one of the most significant is that Sue is, has been, was one of the architects of the independent campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, which all of you will recall won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Uh, Sue is also the president of the Medical Association for the Prevention of War. She is a prolific writer, speaker on all sorts of issues of nonviolence and social justice. Uh, tonight, Sue is going to talk about channels to prevent war under a title that we've uh, tossed around called Beyond Catastrophe. So, Sue, can you take us beyond catastrophe? Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, can you hear me? Very clearly. OK, good. Thanks. Um, it's it's a great pleasure to uh, to be here on on this panel, um, and I pay my respects respects to the traditional owners of the Ngunnawal land um, on which I am at uh, at the moment. Um, there's a, an awful lot um, that could be said here, and I've um, greatly appreciated the contributions thus far from the other panelists. Um, so I'm going to have to limit uh, limit what I say. Uh, which is mostly coming from a humanitarian perspective, uh, you will not, not be surprised to hear. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to start off by saying that um, it's imperative that the war in Ukraine finishes. And I'm going to discuss initially two main reasons for, for stating that among many. Uh, and then I'll outline just some of the ways in which this war could be ended and perhaps other wars prevented in future. So the first thing to say is that one, one of the primary reasons that we must end the war in Ukraine is to prevent nuclear war. The Ukraine war is a catastrophe in itself, but if nuclear weapons were used, the situation would, a uh, humanitarian situation would dwarf the harm that has already been caused by this war and could in fact be terminal for much of the civilization that we know. Um, and a number of commentators have stated that our closeness to nuclear war now is as as close, as dangerous as it's been at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis, when in the words of Robert McNamara, who was US Defense Secretary at the time, we came within a hair's breadth of absolute disaster. Now, one of the um, standout lessons from the Ukraine war is the um, total falsehood uh, and false promise of the theory of nuclear deterrence, which tells us that these weapons are good because they prevent wars, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this theory has been proven wrong on many occasions, of course, and this is yet a further example. So Russia invaded US allied Ukraine and both Russia and the US are armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. So the weapons deterred nothing, but they have simply augmented the risks of this war to something which uh, could well be beyond catastrophic. Um, 
and we're, we're aware that we're all aware that President uh, Putin has threatened to use nuclear weapons in this war. He also announced recently that he would transfer uh, nuclear capable missiles to Belarus. And this is apparently a move um, intended to mirror the nuclear sharing arrangement which the US has with five of its uh, allies in NATO, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy and Turkey, which have US nuclear weapons on their, on their soil. To cut to the chase, the only way in which we can prevent nuclear weapons being used is to get rid of these weapons. There is only one thing uh, on the agenda globally, only one initiative which is heading in that direction, and that's the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, which came into effect in January last year. I'm going to say um, a little more on that in a moment, but just before moving on from nuclear things, I'm going to mention also the danger of the nuclear power plants, of which there are 15 in Ukraine. And it has been known for decades that nuclear power plants are very vulnerable to accident, sabotage, attack, hostile attack in the event of a situation um, such as this. Um, so it's not just the nuclear weapons, although that's a primary nuclear risk, but also nuclear power plants, which um, present great risk. So that's the first reason the war must end, to prevent escalation to nuclear war. The second, um, well, the main, main reason which I'll address that this war must end is to protect innocent lives. The longer this war goes on, the more innocent people will be killed, maimed, bereaved, displaced, etc., etc. Now we hear leaders in distant capitals like Washington DC, London, um, especially London, um, Brussels um, and elsewhere marginalising the need for negotiations and they vow to quote support Ukraine but what does supporting Ukraine really mean? Does it mean simply as it seems to uh, mean simply only pouring in more weapons so that the fighting continues? Or does supporting Ukraine, should it in fact take into account the needs of the Ukrainian civilians for the fighting to stop. Now the leaders in these distant capitals, they're not the ones who are living in fear of the next bombs wiping out their family. They're not the ones who've been forced to flee in their millions from everything that they know and love. They're not the ones who are sheltering in, uh, in basements as the bombs fall and the food and clean water are starting to run, run out, etc., etc. So it's not their own lives that these distant leaders are nobly sacrificing, but it's the lives of not only civilians in Ukraine, um, but also conscripts on both sides of this conflict who've been given no real choice but to fight. So um, that's in a very quick nutshell, uh, two of the reasons that the U uh, Ukrainian war must finish. Um, that's easy to say, of course, uh, how could it happen? And none of us will be pretending that any, uh, any of this is easy, of course. But there have been um, plenty of proposals put forward, and we've had some of them outlined um, already. It is absolutely imperative that negotiation, negotiations and dialogue to end the war take place. And as Graham Gill um, has, has outlined all factors that have played a role in bringing us to the current situation must be addressed. Um, both sides' legitimate security concerns must be acknowledged. And I think another of the key lessons of this war is that no country can be secure if its neighbours do not feel secure. Now we're told that negotiation is not possible with somebody like Putin. But how much negotiation was actually possible when NATO leaders consistently over years and years and years ignored everything that Russia said about NATO expansion? The goal of negotiations must be to bring about peace and not to inflict punishment for acts of aggression, no matter how deserved that punishment is. In March, we saw that Ukrainian President Zelensky said that his government was prepared to discuss adopting a neutral status as part of a peace deal with Russia. 
But then quite suddenly things seemed to change when the US shifted the goalposts to not uh, ending the war or ending um, the troops, uh, getting the troops out of Russia, but the goalposts shifted to actually weakening Russia. This pushed diplomacy to one side and created a dangerous risk of escalation to a much greater war. So regardless of the huge difficulties that there are in negotiations, there are plenty of valuable proposals that have been put forward and some of them have been mentioned. Um, neutrality for Ukraine, internationally monitored plebiscites for the Donbass and something similar to determine the future of Crimea a long-term moratorium on NATO expansion, mutual agreement to limit military exercises and border patrols, the banning of Russian and NATO troops from former Soviet republics, and of course, the withdrawal of all Russian troops from Ukraine. I'm just going to say a word that applies to, um, to Australia, but also to other, um, other countries pretty much a, a global global problem. For Australia, if um, uh, rephrase, rephrase what I've just said. The um, one of the things that's needed globally um, is a great increase and in resurrection of skills in diplomacy. And this has been a particular problem in Australia where diplomacy has been degraded and underfunded for many years. Uh, particularly since 2001. Similarly, peace research needs, uh, needs to be properly funded. So trying to promote peace without investing in peace research, it's a bit like trying to prevent cancer without investing in cancer research. In relation to negotiations, nations vow to keep fighting for as long as it takes. But what we need is a commitment to keep negotiating for as long as it takes. A quick word on war crimes trials and the rule of law. The rule of law, we hear a lot about it and it is um, of course critical, but it must be applied consistently without cherry picking. Where there is credible evidence of war crimes committed in Ukraine, and there seems to be ample, of course, those alleged to be responsible must be tried for those crimes. But where were the calls for war crimes following the illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003 and everything that followed? The Costs of War Project at Brown University in the United States estimates that 900,000 people have died in the US, died in the US war on terror. Now were all those 900,000 deaths legitimate lawful killings? Was there not a single war crime that's thought to have taken place in all of that killing? Where are the calls for war crimes trials in relation to the war on terror? And similarly, there's no place for picking and choosing which wars are important and which are not. The wars in Yemen, Palestine, Myanmar, Ethiopia and elsewhere are equally devastating for the millions of people suffering in them. And they equally demand application of the rule of law and attention to tension to bring these wars to an end. Just coming back to uh, nuclear weapons, as I mentioned, nuclear weapons abolition is a critical and increasingly urgent goal. And the only thing that's heading in that direction is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which must be promoted strongly and vigorously so that its normative impact becomes stronger and stronger. A, um, there was a further proposal made quite recently um, in relation to uh, specifically the Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine war. And that proposal was for NATO to plan for all US nuclear warheads in Europe to be withdrawn from Europe and Turkey and such withdrawal to be carried out to actually take place once peace terms are agreed between Ukraine and Russia but basically indicating that we need, um, that there, uh, there is no place for US nuclear weapons in and that nuclear, uh, nuclear sharing in Europe. For Australia, 
in relation to nuclear weapons, Australia cannot credibly condemn Russia's threat to use nuclear weapons when Australia itself shelters under the US nuclear umbrella and refuses to state that these weapons, um, at least past governments I'm referring to here, have refused to state that um, nuclear weapons must never be used under any circumstances. So Australia must reject any role for nuclear weapons in our own defence policies and must sign and ratify the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. And we're extremely heartened that Prime Minister Albanese uh, leading the ALP has committed for Australia to do just that. And we look forward to that. Australia would be the first nuclear umbrella straight state to sign the treaty, sign and ratify the treaty. And this would set a very powerful precedent in the right direction rather than the wrong direction. Uh, a further thing which Australia should be doing is abandoning plans for nuclear powered submarines, which are a highly provocative and destabilizing move. But we don't have time to go into that. The last point I'm going to make um, is under the heading, follow the money. And this is of course referring to the fact that weapons companies around the world, especially the world's biggest, are making huge profits, billions of dollars from the suffering in Ukraine uh, right at the moment. Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, BAE Systems and others. They make profit not only from wars when wars break out, but from warmongering and promoting tensions between nations. Uh, there's an awful lot that could be said on this. The, the weapons industry needs to be reined in. One of the developments which is happening um, certainly in Australia and globally is the um, attempts of the weapons industry to um, insert themselves, successful attempts, I should say, to insert themselves in educational institutions, um, not only universities, but also secondary and down to primary schools in an attempt to interest the, uh, the best STEM students in a career in the industry. And MAPW um, is currently updating a report we've done on this called Miners and Missiles. So, um, everything possible must be done to rein in the weapons industry rather than let it run wild as it does at the moment. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Stuart, well, Sue, Sue, thank you very much, uh, particularly for that reminder about the, um, the, the deep throat Watergate follow the money um, advice. Um, but thank you too for stressing the the need to hear the victims of war. Thank you, too, for stressing the almost complete absence of well-funded peace research. An unfortunate distinction of university administration for about 20 years is to close down anything that looked like peace research. But I'm here to promote peace, not conflict. Um, and uh, at this point, I really need to go to uh, introducing my wonderful polymath colleague, uh, a very cosmopolitan uh, social scientist, uh, Professor Joe Cam Camilleri, former professor of international relations at La Trobe, uh, distinguished by his work um, uh, as the director of the Centre for Dialogue, and more recently as the architect of this very important social movement known as Conversations at the Crossroads. There's a lot more I could say about Joe. Most of you will know him well, and most of you hopefully will have read some of his books. Uh, welcome, Joe, to the screen and, and the microphone. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. The uh, Ukraine conflict, uh, and I want to put this as a very strong proposition, is not just another conflict. It is, I think, one of the clearest signs of our contemporary predicament. The mayhem in Ukraine and its appalling consequences may well be a taste of things to come. And so to deal constructively with a conflict, let alone to achieve a sustainable peace in Ukraine, in Europe and beyond, we must come to term with the scale of the dangers before us. Uh, but first a few words on the decade-long conflict 
affecting Ukraine. Right now, let's remember, the fighting is inflicting thousands of civilian casualties, military casualties on both sides in the tens of thousands, probably, destruction of social and industrial infrastructure, which will take decades to rebuild, and wholesale displacement of people. In short, an unmitigated tragedy. So let me be clear, the Russian use of force is legally unjustifiable, ethically reprehensible, and an affront to the human conscience. Uh, but that is not all. We have seen poorly thought out US-led sanctions, which have led, of course, to Russian countermeasures, which are creating economic havoc in many countries, including many of those who are imposing sanctions increased instability in the international trading and financial system. And as we know, interruption of grain supplies, rising costs of foodstuffs, fuels, fertilizer, transport, the result, we are told, we should expect an extra 50 million people to go hungry in the months, perhaps years ahead. The grain agreement just signed offers welcome relief, uh, but I caution, it covers only the next three months and implementation must surely remain uncertain at this point. We have a toxic atmosphere compounded by US vitriol and personal insult. And as uh, we've heard already, a well orchestrated US led propaganda campaign to which mainstream media in the West have been willing accomplices. The cumulative toll, I suggest, of half-truths, disinformation, and in some cases, outright deception will be felt for years to come. The Russian military operation, as it is called, is certainly distressing, but so is the prelude to it. Successive waves of NATO expansion, as we've heard, as something we were promised would never happen, uh, brought the US-led military alliance right to Russia's doorstep. The coming to power of a government in neighboring Ukraine intent on joining NATO added fuel to the fire. And over the last eight or more years, the US and its allies have ramped up sanctions against Russia and increased quite dramatically NATO deployments and joint exercises in, in Europe, Eastern Europe. It has deployed a ballistic missile defense system in Romania, and soon another will follow in Poland. It has withdrawn, very important, from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, undoing one of the greatest achievements of the peace movements of the 80s. And all the way through, the foolish, consistent, and ultimately counterproductive refusal of the West to consider at all seriously Russia's long-standing grievances and proposals. Put simply, the US and some of its NATO allies have much to answer for. The war in Ukraine, portrayed by many as a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, is at its core, and we have to understand this, a conflict between Russia and the United States. And so a new Cold War is now well and truly with us. And what is the aim of the US establishment? To arrest the decline of US power and influence and restore US dominance in a rules-based order where it sets the rules and others dutifully obey. To curb Russia's resurgence and China's rise, US elites are intent on continuing to project military power on a global scale. Are US objectives achievable? Are its two adversaries willing to play by US imposed rules, China and Russia? Are they prepared to play second fiddle to an America intend on global supremacy? The answer to all three questions is clearly no. Neither Russia nor China is likely to be intimidated. They are laying down clear red lines. Russia will not countenance Ukraine membership of NATO. China will not accept Taiwanese independence. And so the question is, will the US concede 
that it can no longer exercise exclusive control of the security landscape, or whether in Europe or in Asia Pacific? Is it ready to coexist with others in a multi-centered world? Uh, the answer to that question is not reassuring. And so not surprisingly, the nuclear shadow looms larger than at any time during the Cold War. At any time during the Cold War. And in some ways, it looms larger than at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. On the Russian side, in recent weeks and months, within hours of Russia's foray into Ukraine, Putin warned to anyone who would consider, and I quote, interfering from outside, if you do, you will face consequences greater than you have faced in history. All the relevant decisions have been taken, end of quote. And soon after, he moved to place Russia's nuclear deterrent on high alert. In a later speech, apparently referring to recent Russian tests of hypersonic and intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, that can carry nuclear weapons, he said, we have all the tools for this that no one else can boast of having, end of quote. Speaking at St. Petersburg recently, he declared, quote, we are not threatening anyone but everyone should know what we have and what we will use to defend our sovereignty, end of quote. Clearly the Russian president's language is disturbing, but it is not unique to Russia. Three weeks ago in Madrid, the NATO summit adopted the new strategic concept, which describes NATO as a nuclear alliance committed to, and I quote, high intensity, multi-domain nuclear war fighting against nuclear armed peer competitors. NATO's nuclear posture, it went on, relies on the forward deployment of US nuclear weapons in Europe. With short range nuclear weapons fit facing each other across Russia's long border with NATO, the Ukraine conflict has a clear message. There is no margin for error. And so unless we check and then reverse the polarization in US-Russia-China relations, we run a risk, a high risk of nuclear confrontation. And behind each of these moves and counter moves lies the relentless logic of exterminism. A concept proposed by the eminent British historian E.P. Thompson at the height of the missile crisis in the 80s. Thompson pointed to the then militarization of politics. As he put it, and I quote him, decisions about weaponry now impose the political choices of tomorrow. The pressure rises upwards from laboratories and strategic uh, simulation rooms all the way to the defense secretary, the president's national security advisor, eventually the president. And so decisions taken in Washington then become the decisions of an unelected military assembly, NATO. And the parallel process we see now, 40 years later, is eerily striking. So what is exterminism? It is the relentless march of a society's politics, economy, and its military machine towards extermination. Though the final trigger may be accidental, extermination will not be accidental. As E.P. Thompson argues, quote, the direct consequence of prior acts of policy, of the accumulation and perfection of the means of extermination, and of the structuring of whole societies so that these are directed uh, towards that end. Only one conclusion is possible. A lasting peace requires that the cancer of exterminism itself be removed. It's not just the nuclear weapon. Surgery is called for. We need an overhaul of the structures, the processes, and might I say, the personnel that presently shape national security policies. And for this, 
we need to connect the energies, resources, insights of many countries, many cultures, many belief systems. Australia, of course, is an integral part of the mess we're in. We are currently tied to the apron strings of a great and powerful ally, but let's call a spade a spade. That great and powerful ally is a euphemism for a military, industrial, technological, political machine, the outcome of which can only be the extermination of multitudes. So this institutional shift also requires a cultural shift. We, the Australian public, have to reflect long and hard on the dramatic changes taking place in the world, the strategic choices before us, and the human and material assets at our disposal. Leadership of various kinds and from any sources will be needed. It will not come from the obvious sources. It will not come from the political class or the mainstream media, content as they are to echo the dictates from on high the corridors of influence in Washington. And so engaging a wider public is now the urgent task of the moment. And as a first step, we can engage those organizations and networks whose work is negatively affected by current security, the current security climate and security policies. A good example is the development and overseas aid sector. It is faced with a disgracefully low aid budget compared to rising defense and security budgets. And it is uh, faced with the devastating impact of wars in which we participate and oppressive regimes which we support courtesy of the US alliance. Similarly, we can engage all those working on conflict resolution, civil liberties, human rights, violence against women, refugees and asylum seekers, the environment, climate change, public health, justice for our First Nations, cultural diversity, all without exception are negatively affected by great power confrontation, by oppressive security laws, by rising military budgets, destructive military activities, not to mention the prospect of nuclear catastrophe. The conversation then will need to engage also the insights and expertise of trade unions, professional networks in education, law, medicine, nursing, media, communications, farmer organizations, religious bodies, human-centered think tanks and research centers. They must all be brought into the conversation clearly, sharply and systematically. The key to success lies in making connections. Connections which take account of the different interests, circumstances, and capacities of each sector. It involves informal and highly structured conversations, face-to-face -face and online, small and large groups. Yes, the spoken and written word, no doubt, discussion papers, fact sheets, podcasts, and the like, but also the visual and performing arts, art workshops, exhibitions, music, theater, film, not forgetting fiction, poetry, religious ceremonies, sport, and meditation. Are there encouraging signs on which to build? Yes. A re-energized younger generation keen to address the ravages of climate change. All around us signs of personal and social anxiety, waiting to be channeled into constructive engagement a growing appetite on the part of many for more holistic ways of thinking, for ways of connecting society, economy, environment, culture, and politics. To take advantage of these possibilities, we need skills that make for multi-issue, multidisciplinary conversations and projects, and a new energizing language that breaks with the cliches of the past. With the Ukraine as the backdrop, this is a good time to set in motion well-prepared and adequately resourced small and large community consultations leading up to several national assemblies to review where we're at and where we should be heading. And at the same time, connecting personally and organizationally with our friends and partners in Asia, the Middle East, Europe, North America, and beyond. The stakes are high. 
Yes, we need a multi-step, well-thought-out peace plan for Ukraine that emerges from extensive international consultation and musters widespread international public support. It has a long way to go before we reach such a plan. A peace plan that silences the guns in Ukraine, but more than that. A plan that reshapes the security architecture in Europe and reframes the international security <laughs> conversation. This is then our opportunity to imagine and shape a world around the twin notions of human and ecological security, free of the nuclear scourge. Daunting? Yes, but doable. Joe, that was brilliant. Um, cosmopolitan in the sense that um, uh, you've, you've used words about cultural shift, you've used the language, the threatening language in the references to exterminism, and I want to come back a bit later, I think, to the, to the idea of cosmopolitanism, which is about embracing all those diverse conversations and people that you mentioned. And in particular, thank you for the mention of the reference to the violence of climate change and the more optimistic reference to the value of music and poetry, which is my cue now to, uh, uh, to invite uh, the wonderful Jemima Omari to remind us of the prophetic words of John Lennon in this famous and reassuring song, Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven It's easy if you try No hell below us Above us holy sky I think we'd all agree that was a wonderful message from John Lennon and from Jemima, and uh, perhaps it's hit the most um, optimistic note of the evening so far. Um, I want to thank all four speakers for keeping um, marvelously within time, even though the, they had to cover a diverse range of, uh, of evidence and topics. We're going to proceed now to uh, questions. I've got more than enough already in front of me um, to, um, to, uh, to pose to the panel. Um, the first one is, the first question from Ian Kerr says, where, where, where and how, where exactly do you, members of the panel, any member of the panel, begin the peace process? Does anybody want to duck, duck for cover or anybody respond to that one? Well, we, we could do with a retrospective of the Kosovo crisis, it seems to me. This is where um, NATO changed its rules, where previously um, it would only operate as NATO on the territory of a member state. It adopted a new rule that allowed it to act as an alliance outside the territory of its member states. And of course that um, in Russian eyes transformed it from a purely defensive alliance to one with an avowed offensive capability and intention. And it was next used as the organizing principle for NATO's lead role in the ISAF in Afghanistan, which is, you know, from Moscow's point of view, a Praetorian state. But interestingly, uh, NATO in the Kosovo crisis eventually kind of wriggled itself onto a hook of its own making, and it had to turn to uh, the EU and Russia for help. And it's appointed two mediators, Marty Atasari, the Finnish uh, president, and the former Russian Prime Minister, Viktor Chernomyrdin, um, to broker an agreement. And that is really um, the um, insight that is going to spur um, moves towards peace, I think. The um, statement uh, that was covered from the United Nations Sustainable Development Network in the piece in Pearls and Irritations that I referred to uh, makes the point that at the moment um, uh, a, a military victory doesn't appear to be imminent and perhaps not even in sight um, for either party. And that could be uh, viewed as a, a mutually hurting stalemate uh, and that is classic um, uh, conditions for moving towards negotiations but as I was saying um, we, we have to be prepared to um, understand the reasons why the parties to the conflict are behaving 
as they do. Otherwise, they, they appear unreasonable and there's no point reasoning with them. Uh, so really, um, you know, in order to get where we want in the present, we have to be prepared to delve back into the past to see the causes of the conflict and by the same token exits from the conflict, not only in the here and now in the conflict arena, uh, but over a broader time frame and a broader conflict formation. We okay. could start Kosovo. Um, a question from, I think, directed, looks to me, to, to Graham. What does he think uh, President Putin would be satisfied with? If you're there, Graham, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry, sure. I, what, okay. what, <laughs> what, what would he be satisfied with? Well, I think the minimum that he would be satisfied with is, uh, is Russian control over Donbass the recognition of Russian control in Crimea and the recognition of uh, Russian control over a ground, uh, uh, a ground um, pathway between Crimea and, um, and Russia itself. Ideally, I think what he would want is not only that, but he would also like to extend Russian control um, further to the, uh, further to the uh, west over what is now southern Ukraine, but what in the past was called Novorossiya, which is essentially the, the, the section of Ukraine which borders on the Black Sea. Um, but I suspect that that, that is something that, that if, if real negotiations were to start, that he might be willing to move on. In other words, I think what he would want would be control over those areas, Donbass, Crimea, and the land bridge between them. He would want a guarantee of, uh, of Ukrainian neutrality. He would want a withdrawal of, uh, of um, um, all of the weapons that the, uh, that the West has given to, uh, given to Ukraine. And he would want a guarantee, um, uh, sort of a non-aggression guarantee, if you like, from NATO um, for Russia. I think okay. that's what he would want. So, thanks, Graham. Now a question from Miroslav Sandev to the panel. How can you, how can we effectively oppose Western imperialism and Russian imperialism without falling into the camp of either? Joe. Switch your, you're on mute, Joe. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Okay. Yes, I think the important thing is uh, not to be over uh, fixated on a state centric lens. I think that's very crucial to understanding both where we're at uh, and where we might ideally be able to go. That is to say, yes, of course, states will at some point uh, be the ones that uh, occupy the negotiating table. Uh, yes, they will be the ones that will have to sign off on this or that, uh, but they will largely respond. Uh, states at the end of the day, to some extent at least, uh, tend to be reactive. Uh, and imperial powers are no exception to this. Uh, if we cast our mind back to the early 80s and the extraordinary movement that arose, which went way beyond uh, peace organizations, uh, that demanded an end to the deployment of intermediate range uh, nuclear missiles in Europe. The pressure became so great that several governments that had previously European uh, supported the, such deployment had to change tack, although otherwise they would have fallen. And a whole series of events then gradually developed, which created a new atmosphere by the mid 80s to that which had existed in the early 80s. So I think the initiative will lie to some extent, to some extent, on certain governments which are well placed uh, to occupy some kind of position uh, which can be close to mediation. Uh, and uh, Turkey has shown this, it has done it, uh, it is showing it, and it's doing it uh, usually in association with the UN Secretary General. Uh, there are other governments that are similarly placed that could play a role. Eventually, we will have to get to a position where both France and China play a constructive role. One as a close friend, strategic partner of Russia, the other as a key NATO ally. Uh, 
that will take a little time. Uh, but uh, whether there is this kind of uh, concerted systematic push on many fronts will depend on the public temper in many of these societies. And that's why I'd like to put uh, the emphasis on what civil society can do, even inside Russia, in somewhat more difficult circumstances, but um, uh, also, of course, in, in Europe, North America, Australia, and many other parts of the world. So it's got to be a multi-layered approach in which many actors are playing a part and in which they are increasingly synchronized and to some extent coordinated. It will take some doing, but there are many other examples of that having happened, having happened in the past. Uh, so there's no need to despair just yet. Okay. Now I, I, there, we have a, a, a Ukrainian in the audience, um, Michael Blistein, who, who would like to speak, and I certainly would welcome that. So I'll take one more question and then invite uh, Michael Blistein from the audience to make his um, contribution. But it would have to be relatively uh, precise or brief. The, the, the question, uh, it's really a question that I'm distilling from, from a long uh, point of view, which is about Australia's role in, in um, trying to encourage its ally, the United States, to, to declare that it would never have a, uh, a first use um, of, of nuclear weapons. Would it, engage, would it agree with non-first use of nuclear weapons? It's, it's a question really about the steps to, um, uh, that, um, that Sue was referring to, to erode the, the chances of, um, of the use of nuclear weapons. Do we, have any intervent, do we have any influence, the Australian government, with the United States about the potential use of nuclear weapons is another way to put it. Go for it, Sue. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we're, um, we're all, always told about Australia's special relationship with the United States, although we, we don't often see much, um, much evidence of it. Um, and the evidence that we do have um, from over quite a number of years that is that Australia doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to be a strong advocate for um, nuclear weapons free world and uh, and uh, and other steps but um, I think and especially uh, heartened by um, Anthony Albanese's commitment to Australia signing the nuclear weapons ban treaty I think we should expect and could um, could push the uh, push the notion of Australia uh, trying to exert more influence over the US and its uh, nuclear weapons policy and especially reducing reliance on nuclear weapons um, in Australia. As, as mentioned, there, is, there are things that we specifically can do there. Um, on, the, uh, on the issue of no first use, this has been a little bit contentious. Um, some within the disarmament community are strongly in favour of pushing um, commitments to no first use. Um, the difficulty that some others see is that um, a commitment to no first use sort of implies that second second use is um, is okay. So I think most people would would welcome commitments to uh, to no first use, but um, by no means should it uh, replace pressure for um, for the elimination of these weapons for reducing the role that they play in defence policies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, the latter, reducing the role that nuclear weapons play in defence policies. I mean, all the member states to the NPT, um, which is most of the countries in the world, um, are committed to reducing the role that nuclear weapons play in their defence policies. Um, uh, a commitment that that hasn't really been fulfilled. So, a yes to no first use, but um, but only as a part and not as a substitute for signing and ratifying the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. Look, quick quick corollary to that before I invite Mr. Bechstein from the audience to speak. Um, our colleague John Hallam is disputing the the idea that um, uh, nuclear holocaust could be uh, accidental. He, I think he's saying, look, the risk is 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 not merely. Uh, I, I'm 
this from somebody is, making a mistake. Accidental. I'm insisting that it most likely would be accidental. Oh, it, oh, it would be. I'm sorry, John. I've, You've I've got missed it. precisely upside down. Okay. Um, but um, madness, malice, malfunction, malware, and miscalculation are overwhelmingly the most likely routes to an accidental apocalypse. However, recent developments do lead me to think that non-accidental apocalypses might also be with us. Okay, well that was the... I no. that accidental was the sole route to okay. an Sure. Okay. I did misinterpret you, but but you're now saying correctly, I think, that the, the non-accidental is um, is a pretty... Is a well, it's we... also on the table. On the table. Okay. Um, okay. Um... Accidental remains the overwhelmingly most probable route to an apocalypse, and okay. I guesstimate our chances over the next 10 years at 50-50 max. All right. Well, by the end of this evening, we, we will be back. We'll, we will we'll, we'll have erased the 50 50 threat. Um, could I invite uh, uh, Mike, Michael Bickstein? I can see you there. Uh, please, happy to have your contribution. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Yeah, thank you. I'm sincerely grateful, actually, to the organizers of this forum to be in tune with the whole world of uh, really to counter up the war in Ukraine. Thank you for letting to share some ideas regarding that issue. I really like the structure and plan of that forum to understand the reason of the cause of the war. And this is, you've got three uh, like questions and I would like to share with you some ideas. And first of all, it's uh, uh, first question, what led to the war Russian war in Ukraine, actually not Ukraine war, it's Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, even I am mathematician, that's why I am really like a logical uh, approaches to everything. I'm not taking any sides, but I just would like to share what it seems to me is true. In my, it's, uh, my, it's not my opinion, it's all based on the real facts which are supported around the world, not just uh, journalists or some uh, kind of teachers, by most the presidents of Europe and US and by minister of defense of more than 40 countries in the world. In Europe, actually, they're mostly in America. Yeah. For many centuries, all Russian Tsars not only conquered and oppressed Ukrainian people, and Ukraine actually, was since it was called, maybe everyone knows, but it called and that in nine centuries when it appears on a map in 1883, it was uh, Kiev Rus. And only in 100 years time, Kiev Rus was baptized before it was pagan. And Moscovitia, the Moscow and all Russia is still uh, wasn't on a map at all. Only in the 11th centuries, it appears Novgorod, it's north city of current Russia. That's why uh, uh, what Scram said that it was uh, not like country like Ukraine, it's not right. In reality, it was own language and therefore Russian language is start roots from Ukraine uh, ancient a kind of uh, particularly from uh, priest it was called old orthodox language right it was uh, it was really cultural it was cossacks it was a little bit later in 10 11 centuries it's not russian cossacks it was very similar uh, rus and russia they have nearly not the same actually roots, but it sounds very similar. That's why it's very easy was to substitute Kiev Rus for Russians, for Russia, like it sounds in Russian. It's very easy 
to pretend that it was Russian people in that. But in reality, Russians are now all in Eastern Europe because it, uh, when Ukraine was first independent, it was taken by Lithuania and uh, some other uh, Eastern countries. They've got Russians still uh, there now in this moment. Yeah, Ma Michael, but, Michael, yeah. just a minute. Mike, can I? I'll have to give you a couple of minutes. I've got about 30 questions on my list. So if you can, I value, and we all do your contribution, but can you roll it up within two minutes? Because I have about 30 questions to, to pose within the next 20 minutes. Yeah, okay. uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I just uh, wanted to put in a point, this is the really history of what we really can answer what we can do it can be peace at all i think it's the most important forum this is why we gathered here this is the question is can we do something australian as australian or can be done at all for peace anything if you want me to be very short of course i can a few minutes i can say you something but it's i believe the history what i started i think it's the most important to understand this question but uh, i can be much uh, yeah shorter as i understand everybody should say each uh, each person actually in that world should come uh, at this moment to decision what is good and what is is evil to make every effort to spread out moral and ethical qualities around the world otherwise as said french philosopher jean uh, jean jacques rousseau civilization would be destroyed by itself actually the russian foreign minister lavrov uh, on wednesday uh, you know he repeated actually every month since the war started five months ago, that Russia was ready for peace talks on the absolutely inadmissible condition for Ukraine. The Ukraine main aim was and ever will be to free the captured lands from the enemy. And the Wednesday, on the Wednesday, this Wednesday, Lavrov said that Moscow signals plans to widen its military offensive to go beyond the whole eastern part of Donbass, along the southern part of Ukraine, along Black and Azov Seas. Thus, these peace talks were not possible earlier, and particularly now, when Russia threatened to catch more lands from Ukraine. Because the simple answer to all this what talk about peace is just what all world now agreed i wanted to stop on this area who told and when told in europe but it's easier yeah. the question okay. is who, all all soldiers from the ukrainian land should be away and then would be peace That's it's right. easy very sure. easy sure. answer thank you very much i really well, appreciate michael it. michael thank you for that contribution i'm sorry that i as befits any almost peace negotiations you have to sometimes cut people short and um, uh, it would be good to talk to you again. I'm going to now move to a question which really um, takes up um, Joe's reference to exterminism. Ian Blakeney asks, extermination means everything, not just human. What can ordinary beings do to halt the juggernaut? Simply voting and support by words isn't going to work, is it? How do you, so, Joe, that sounds like an easy question for you. <laughs> no, it's not. And I think that's what I really covered in much of my talk, certainly the second half of it. Uh, there needs to be, uh, if we're going to, we, we have a number of existential threats to deal with uh, as an international community. And uh, that will require a very considerable amount of work on the part of a very large number of people. Uh, if you want uh, uh, my back of the envelope calculation, we need about 10% of the adult population 
around the world to become engaged on facing all of these challenges. And the key to that, in my view, in the first instance, is going to be extended, in-depth, thoughtful, respectful, uh, informed conversation in small and large groups, creating a buzz and an energy that no one uh, will be able to ignore or would do so at their peril. So we've got a long way to go before we do that. And it will be interesting to see whether we can even make a beginning of that in Australia. Um, look, a similar question from, um, from Aina Dimopoulos, um, who's really referring to the, the fascination of governments with militarism as a form of security. So that if, so that the massive buildup of, of arms and, and alliances to support armaments um, treat, treat external populations as of little consequence. How, in other words, the, the fascination with militarism as central features of so-called security is, is builds the momentum to, to um, conflict and if not extermination. So the issue there is about this, this fascination that militarism, as with the Australian purchase of uh, nuclear weapons, it, it represents a form of security. So are you, okay. are you, are you uh, volunteering to purchase nuclear, nuclear submarines? No, too expensive. Thanks. Um, thanks, Stuart. Um, I think I think there are, you know, there are sort of some chinks in the, in that armour of, of militarism that governments, uh, including the Australian government, um, have put on. And in relation to climate, I mean, the governments are no longer able to ignore the call and the repeated statements that uh, climate change is is one of our greatest security threats uh, and it's the impact on people it's the disasters it's the pacific island nations who are seeing their their homes disappear it's all of that it's the it's a human impact that um the governments are no longer able to ignore so um i think i think there are ways that we can um get around this fascination with with militarism that you you rightly point out and I th I'm I'm reminded of of the words of Joseph Ropplet um, nuclear scientist who received the Nobel Peace Prize um, and on for his work on nuclear weapons um, nuclear disarmament and on receiving that he the three most memorable words he stated were remember your humanity and forget the rest and I think if we can bring things back to our common humanity as much as possible then um, it's hard for governments to argue around that not easy I know but I think bringing things back to our humanity and as Joe and others have pointed out bringing in aid organizations um, humanitarian organizations um, speaking out about the whether it's the war in Ukraine or the or what's happening in Myanmar or elsewhere um, I think that's a powerful part of um, a powerful tool that we can use Okay, okay. A quest, question now um, from Alastair McCullum, and I'm really going to um, take poetic, poetic license and interpret what is, it's really a question about uh, how feasible is comprehensive cultural change, in, in, even in a country like Australia, certainly in, a, in, in, a, in a, the United States, which looks as though it's, it's ungovernable, and certainly with regard to a totalitarian system uh, across across Russia um, and 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 else and and uh, and in China how how can comprehensive cultural change um, be um, be given a catalyst well i, I better say something uh, on that, Stuart. Well, yes, well, you're the guilty party. You introduced it, Joe. Yes, yes. Well, uh, the, the simple question is, th the simple point is this, that if you look historically, uh, every major turning point, um, whether we're looking at the Renaissance, whether we're looking at uh, uh, the revolutionary period, 
including the French Revolution and other revolutions that occurred in different parts of Europe uh, within a space of uh, 50 to 100 years. If we look at the, the response and the reaction uh, to the evils of the Industrial Revolution, the birth of the welfare state, if we look more recently at um, the uh, uh, overcoming of the policy of apartheid in South Africa, if we look at the end of the Cold War, uh, you can see that all of that uh, was uh, the summation, or if you like, coming of, to a climax of a series of cultural currents, which were in some, in some cases long in the making, and to which then at some point, a great number of people were willing to make strong commitments of time, energy and place. And eventually that filters through uh, to some of the policy making uh, structures and institutions nationally and internationally. So it is possible, it has happened historically. Uh, sometimes it looks pretty bleak and we may not see exactly how this might unfold in the short term, uh, but that I think ultimately, ultimately, it's a decision that every single person has to make for himself or herself. Confronted with these uh, uh, existential uh, threats, emergencies, call them what you will, uh, with the possibility of conflicts getting out of control, uh, where do I stand and where am I in relation to my human network of contacts, friends, colleagues, whoever, uh, is this a lively uh, subject of conversation uh, and is there any initiative that emerges from those conversations? It's a question we all have to answer for ourselves individually and collectively. In a way, Joe, the multiplication of these forums would uh, start to contribute to what you're, what you're uh, arguing for. Here's a question really for every member of the panel, I think, and it comes it, against the background of the former Prime Minister of Australia in a Pentecostal church, uh, ridiculing or getting a cheap laugh about, uh, about the uselessness of the United Nations. From Nathan Fell, the question, where is the UN in all of this? So I'm going to I'm going to put you on the spot. I think we need a response from each from all four of you at this at this point, because I, it seems to me the the idea of the UN and the the significance of the UN is so important. Well, that um, uh, UN Sustainable Development Network is admittedly a very liminal section of the organisation, um, but um, it has been prepared to, um, as it were, say the unsayable that um, for all the well-documented, abusive, horrendous, um, criminal, genocidal acts of Russia, um, there is no easy, obvious way to proceed to reverse those by military means. Um, and equally, um, as Graham was saying, you know, President Putin has quite possibly been um, confounded in his assumption that there would be a, a quick military win um, on his side. Uh, therefore, you know, if we're heading to a situation of, of mutually hurting stalemate, what do we do about it? Um, and that, that's unsayable so far as the majority of media coverage is concerned, because it's not a theme that's taken up by the usual sources for journalism. Uh, and now, indeed, here in Australia, those sources have pretty much stopped talking about Ukraine, so it's fading from the headlines. Uh, so when there is some activity um, from um, uh, any intergovernmental organization or any uh, contact across borders, it does need to be met with um, commensurate responses that draw it to our attention. And pearls and irritations in that particular case is doing a good job. I'll just redouble my point. We need a very great deal more um, of that kind of media and journalistic activity, even to bring ourselves to the level which is familiar from um, other places such as the United States the UK and the European Union countries. So in, in a media domain, that would be the priority. Graham, do you want to comment about the role of the UN or the abs alleged absence of the UN? Um, yeah, I don't, no, sorry, Joe, go on. No, you go. You go ahead. Go ahead, Graham. Um, I'd just like to say that the, that the, the, problem, the problem with the UN in this case is twofold. One is that whenever the conflicts involve uh, 
any one of the five members, five nuclear members of the Security Council, the permanent members of the Security Council, the UN is hamstrung in its decision-making procedures to do things. The second thing is, uh, and this relates back to something I alluded to in my talk, the vast majority of members of the UN would probably be unwilling to be involved or to have the UN involved in any coercive capacity in trying to end this. Because if we look at, the, at what the, the, the UN has done and, and at the votes in the UN, initially, the overwhelming majority of countries uh, condemned the Russian invasion. It was something like, I think, I think the figure is 141 in the General Assembly. I'm not completely sure of that, but I think it's 141. But of those 141, the overwhelming majority of them have not been willing to support sanctions against Russia and have not been willing to undertake active measures <laughs> against Russia. And that's because, I think, for a lot of countries, there is considerable justice in the claims that the, that the Russians make about an aggressive NATO. And so if the, if the overwhelming majority of countries are unconvinced of the need for the UN to actively act against Russia, as opposed to peacekeeping, you know, as opposed to interposing themselves in a peacekeeping capacity, um, uh, it, there's very little room for the UN to move. And given that what we've got is, is, is conflict between the permanent members of the Security Council, that also makes it very difficult for the UN to do anything at all, I think, in terms of interposing itself as a, uh, as a mediator for peace. Uh, okay, uh, Joe. Jo? Uh, Stuart, I, uh, I slightly disagree with Graham. Uh, it's true. I think the Security Council is paralyzed. Uh, when it comes to a Security Council permanent member uh, directly involved in a conflict, even if uh, so, that, that's always been the case. And in one sense, wisely so, who would want? The, United, uh, the UN taking military action against a nuclear, uh, nuclear superpower, it could only effectively do it if it were to call upon uh, the resources, the forces, uh, the military capability uh, of another nuclear superpower, the United States, which would be war by another name, potentially nuclear war. It would make very little difference and offer very little consolation if it had courtesy of the UN uh, ascribed to it. So uh, if we're looking for a UN role, it will not come from the Security Council. Maybe from the General Assembly, it will first and foremost come from the UN Secretary General. And we've seen that in the grain agreement that has just been um, uh, uh, reached in, in Istanbul. So there are these smaller ways, and there is a, a place for the UN Secretary General to be making statements, even provocative statements, that one or other um, permanent member of the Security Council may not like. Eventually, there will be a ceasefire, eventually, and if it is to be of any uh, duration, and uh, any value, it'll have to be internationally monitored. And the UN remains uh, the best place where, which can do the monitoring. And there'll be many other functions associated with uh, reconstruction, uh, with a dividing line between um, uh, Russian forces and Ukraine forces, uh, between the uh, nature of the agreement to be reached and so on. So I think at the moment, uh, it'll in part depend on what the UN Secretary General can do. And if he's got any brains, and the present one appears to have a few, he will do it in concert with some well-placed governments, which makes it very difficult to oppose. So if he were doing something with the help of the likes of South Africa, uh, Turkey, potentially a European member of NATO, perhaps in due course India or China, uh, then what the UN Secretary General says uh, carries weight, uh, which neither nuclear superpower would be altogether enthusiastic about rejecting outright. Okay, okay. All right, no more 
Uh, do you want to say anything, Sue? Otherwise, I'll go to another question. Uh, just to to agree basically with what Joe was saying that the um, the UN has a lot of roles to play important critical roles for which it's uniquely placed uh, other than military so-called solutions and for example monitoring of plebiscites would be a um, a very good example of that okay well there's a question here which is very dear to my heart it comes from from Professor Olivier Urbain at Soka University in Tokyo who's been involved for years very impressively in um, work in music, the use of music and peace building. And he asks you, uh, how do you see um, concretely and feasibly uh, an enhancement of the effectiveness, effectiveness of music in the arts in halting the, the military juggernauts? I mean, I'd like to answer that question myself, but I'm only in the chair. Um, any of you I can think you that. should, Stuart. Well, look, you know, just when just at the point at which at which the British were totally deceived over Brexit and they rejected the European Union and they rejected the their any recall that the initial stage in initial stages of the initial arguments about European Union had to do with peace. It wasn't it wasn't about the uniformity of currency. It was about peace in Europe after centuries of carnage. And, uh, and all the people who voted for Brexit need to be reminded that the national anthem of the European Union is, is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the Peace Symphony, of which the, um, the, um, the uh, libretto was taken from Schiller's great poem, The Ode to Joy, which he said in an echo of the demand for doing something about climate change, he wanted that libretto and the music associated with Beethoven to be a kiss for the whole earth. Um, that's my, that's as encouraging as I can be to um, my dear friend, Professor Urbain at Stockholm University in, in Tokyo. Anybody else? On, on the value of music? Yes, well, I'll yeah. say a quick word, a quick word. I think we should do more of what was done today as part of this forum, uh, introduce music into um, uh, the spoken word, the discussion, the forum side, the debates. Um, but I think you can have also music events per se, and importantly, to make international connections with them, to have musicians traveling, uh, singers, musicians traveling from one part of the world to another, uh, which is easier to handle uh, than political commentators or journalists even. Uh, so in other words, it makes for easier travel, uh, and that applies to arts in other forms, but music certainly, and you can get perhaps even larger audiences than you can get for some of your forums, debates, and um, um, and uh, um, the, the kinds of intellectual activities that some of us go for. Sure. sure. Look, um, I just want to apologize to several people in the audience who've had their hands up, and who've had their hands up uh, more than once. So I'm going to finish with a kind of question that looks like a break on our enthusiasm, because over 400 people registered uh, for this event. It's obviously, um, uh, people are obviously thirsty for it. Um, but uh, Mr. Casey Bowie says that he, that he passed on the invitation to his networks to participate in this event, and he received no reply. But what he's saying, what he's saying is, what he's saying, I think, is that there is a huge public indifference. There's a fascination with, um, I mean, in America, for example, we, we're told that people are only concerned about inflation and the cost of petrol. So um, uh, we've got, we've, we're preaching to, we've got 400 more enthusiasts who registered for this event. But um, this gentleman has asked a very significant question. How do you come, how do you overcome um, public indifference or apathy or or even the fatalism then nothing could be done there's a kind of pessimistic question for you all to have a go at to to end with that's be assured that is the last question overcoming overcoming uh, you know i i mean i have that problem because i often chair public meetings in sydney as jake knows and you have sometimes you have to say if there's anybody 
in the audience who's under 70, could they put their hand up? <laughs> so, uh, Stuart, so, go Stuart um, just, a, just a thought, I think we, um, uh, we, we all know the problem of getting overwhelmed by these things. And I think we need to break it down to steps that people can take in their own time and place. I mean, the, the old adage, think globally, act locally. I think that's, um, that's got a, an awful lot, awful lot going for it. So the aspects of militarism that people see that affect them directly, whether it's, you know, spending so much on submarines that we can't afford um, proper education or health care, all of these things um, where people, you know, uh, may maybe will we'll find a voice, um, come out and say something publicly or, or whatever. I think it's a matter of identifying how these big issues affect um, grassroots people all around the world and encouraging people to take what what steps they can, but not expecting people to take on the burden of the cares of the world because they're too great. Oh, sure. I'll just quote a, um, a famous a journalist, famous war correspondent, Martha Gellhorn. Any form of keeping the record is better than just letting things slip away. Um, anybody else about um, public apathy or indifference? Well, it comes in waves, doesn't it, Stuart? Um, uh, there comes a time when there is a buzz in the air. There is a kind of electricity emerging. People begin to sense it. People be begin to become engaged. And that, uh, I think, uh, we have the early signs, perhaps, of that happening. It will take a little bit of doing. Uh, but I have two things to say on that. It's not enough to inform people about events uh, or to tell them about issues. I think we have to engage with them in genuine conversation. Even if people feel disempowered about uh, what's happening in Ukraine or another major conflict or Russian-US relations or the role of China, they have anxieties. They have inchoate, poorly articulated anxieties and we should create opportunities where these can be shared. We should be asking more questions and uh, making less by way of assertive statements. I think that's going to be a very important part of engaging the conversation. And uh, once I feel once there is a clear path, when there is, let's say, for example, a major peace proposal uh, for the resolution of the Ukraine conflict and beyond, and it has the support of a wide cross-section of people internationally, you will see the beginnings of people wanting to say, well, I want to know more about that. How can I engage? What are the practical opportunities for engagement? So uh, it, it, it could well happen much faster than many people think. Uh, one can only hope that this will happen and uh, work consistently to uh, push it along. Okay, uh, look, I'm going to try and risk summing up in about 60 seconds. I can see Alistair, Alistair McCullum in, in the audience with his hand up, but there really isn't time to, but I will, out of respect to you, make your point that, make your, pursue your question. Um, you know, what's, what was the real evidence that, um, that, uh, that the, the start of the war had anything to, to do with NATO? I, I, that's, that's the question. I know you've want, been wanting to, uh, to pose that for the past hour. Um, it's, I'll, I'll leave it as a kind of rhetorical question. I've got three points, I think, to, to, to make by way of summary. And I want to try and do justice to the uh, huge range of first-rate papers that have been presented to us this evening. The first point really concerns a plea for a greater cosmopolitanism. That's to say, the inclusion of the points of view of being able to hear the points of view of diverse peoples, whether Ukrainians or Russians, uh, uh, American opposition group, diverse groups, including indigenous ones within Australia, about the, the future of life on Earth, because that seemed to me to be the, the, uh, the major issue. That comes to the second point about the interdependence uh, of all people. And it, I find it very difficult to see how peace negotiations about the end of uh, military warfare, 
can proceed without a simultaneous and parallel reference to destruction caused by, by, clim by, by climate change. How it could be possible to have any time or expenditure on the weapons of war when the, the threat of uh, the threat, the very real threat to life on Earth um, is, um, is shown by climate change. Um, and the third point I want to make is one that in a way embraces everything we've said. It concerns the, the use of language, the way in which um, thoughts corrupt people's language and language corrupts people's thought. I mean, and the main language we should be talking about is not just about peace, but in my terms about peace with justice. It needs to be, it needs to be a priority topic almost every day of the week. And in that respect, you'd, 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 you would have to believe that the Australian government would create a Department of Defence, uh, as of, of sorry, they you see, I've made the Freudian slip, a Department of Peace and a Minister for Peace. Why wouldn't we have these Ministers for Defence and a whole series of, of uh, militaristic funded think tanks um, to fund defence? So the language, the language issue is crucial. The pessimistic language was the one expressed beautifully by the poet Yeats when he said the centre cannot hold. Um, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. But the optimistic language was that which uh, the wonderful Jemima Omari gave to us when she said, you can think that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. One day we'll be together and the world will be as one. And, and so hence the importance of language. Okay, last point, that's, that's my summary for what it's worth. Last point concerns the, the spin-off, the continuation of what we've been talking about tonight. This is, um, this is not an ending, even though it's got to be on uh, 8.30. Everybody in this audience has an opportunity to advocate, to have the conversations that Joe has referred to, to multiply the fascination with peace with justice, not just with regard to the war in Ukraine, because if we don't have that momentum, the cultural shift that Joe referred to uh, will not happen. The second continuation is one Jake has referred to. Um, each of the four papers will be published in what I regard as probably the most significant online journal in Australia at the moment, namely Pearls and Irritations. Its, uh, its editor and editors are willing to publish uh, points of view that you will never find, uh, extremely well-written points of view that you don't find in the mainstream. Um, and the, the third piece of continuation is that the very significant organization, Raising Peace, for which James Cox, our colleague, has been so influential in, uh, in helping to facilitate tonight's forum, they will be holding their own people's forum, a continuation of this one, in a conference in, um, in, in um, September. And the last bit of reaching out um, is to, um, uh, to people in Japan who at Yosai University in, the, in a couple of weeks' time are holding a face-to-face a -face as well as a Zoom conference on, the, on the, um, the value of the language of peace, the indispensability of the language of peace. And uh, uh, in that respect, I also acknowledge the connection with our former colleague, Paul Duffel, at Rikiko University in Tokyo, and my very good friend, Professor Olivier Arabin, and his music-loving students from all over the world at Sokka University, also in Tokyo. That's more than enough for me. Thank you for your contribution. It's been an exciting event, I think, um, um, a very stimulating one, a very high standard one, and I look forward to the four papers uh, and scratching my head um, individually and, and with many others um, in, in the weeks to come. Thank you for coming. Thank you, James Cox and Raising Peace for uh, facilitating tonight. And um, what's left of this evening, have a good evening. You, you, you're all entitled to another glass of uh, red wine. I noticed Graham had his earlier. <laughs> okay, thank you and good night. <laughs>